Thanks everyone for joining today's session on learning JMeter in 60 minutes, an introduction to performance testing with JMeter. My name is Ophir Prusak from BlazeMeter. Today's session is an introductory session. We won't be going over the more advanced stuff, but I promise you that even if you're an existing JMeter user, there's a good chance you're gonna learn something. Today's session will be recorded and we will send out a link to the recording in a couple of days. So what are we gonna to cover today? We're gonna to start just with a high overview, just a few minutes of what is performance testing. And then we'll go into understanding how JMeter works, the JMeter interface, and some vocabulary in terms of JMeter terms, creating a simple static script. Then we'll go into recording actual browser activity, dealing with user logins and authentication, dynamic requests and user variables, how to get values through regular expressions, and ultimately also CSV files, and at the end, a Q&A. We also have a surprise. At the end of today's session, we will be sharing a coupon code, which will give you a discount to BlazeMeter services. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we won't be covering today, I'll be honest. We are planning a follow-up session with some of the more advanced things, but since there's a lot to cover, Let's go ahead and get started. So just starting by what is performance testing? And I just want to, I guess, uh, put it from a really simple terms is at its core, performance testing is really about ensuring a good user experience, which is fast and error free under any load. And the way we do this is by two simple things. One, creating the user load. And secondly, measuring the user experience. Now, obviously, if we're not creating an accurate user load, or if we're not accurately measuring the user experience, we're not gonna get good results. But in a nutshell, it is those two parts. And we're gonna see today how you can use JMeter to create the user load and to some degree also measure the user experience. So before we can get into how JMeter works, let's understand how a browser works. First thing is a browser sends out a request and that can be done by many different ways. You can enter a URL in your browser window. It could be clicking on a button or it could be an Ajax request, which the browser does on its own. The server responds, it literally says, here's your HTML, your images, maybe your JSON reply, whatever it was. And then the browser will parse the response to see what it is that the, the, the actual server responded with and possibly execute some JavaScript on the page. That's how a browser works. Now it's important to understand that JMeter is not a browser. JMeter is an open source tool, which you can download from the uh, Apache JMeter site. It, since it's a Java based tool, it'll run on Linux, Mac, and PC. We're not gonna cover how to install or get it started with uh, the actual installation process. That's pretty painless to be honest. Today really is about how to use JMeter. So as I said, JMeter isn't a browser, but it's still a tool. It's still a, you know, a, tool, a, a software program which is running. So what is JMeter? How does it work? So the first thing, JMeter will send a request. So unlike in a browser, well, that could be you're clicking on a button, hitting the submit form, or doing an Ajax call, JMeter will always send an HTTP request. The whole concept of clicking on a button, it doesn't matter what actually happened in the browser for JMeter, it's an HTTP request, which means JMeter is talking really kind of at the communication layer. What will happen next is the server respond. In any case, you're making requests, there's going to be a response. But then in terms of that server response, JMeter will optionally parse the response for you. There's different ways we can do that. We can get into a little more of that later. But more importantly, JMeter won't execute the JavaScript. JMeter just is able to take the response and if you need to have a new JavaScript uh, executed, you need to basically understand what it is that that JavaScript is gonna be doing and recreate that within your JMeter script. And then obviously repeat. So that's the first thing, JMeter isn't a browser. Having said that, JMeter can still simulate anything that a browser does because at the end of the day, all of the requests which your browser are making are HTTP requests. So before we go into the actual interface of JMeter itself, there's some vocabulary and some terms we're gonna see within the interface that I wanna make sure everybody's on the same page since I don't know what your existing experience with JMeter is. 
So the first thing is that within JMeter, you'll hear sometimes the term a test plan. That's basically the entire JMeter script or the entire list of actions that you want to take. You'll also hear a thread group or the term thread. Within JMeter, we talk about instead of virtual users or concurrent users, we talk about threads. You'll hear a term called maybe a sampler. This is something which is JMeter's way of saying, I want to make a request. And we have config elements. That's pretty self-explanatory configuration stuff. In JMeter, we talk about timers, but what we're really talking about is adding a delay. We have what's something called a listener. This is elements of basically taking the responses and turning that into report, a log, or for debugging purposes. You might hear the term assertions. That's all about error checking. And then we have pre and post processors. So if I want to modify the request before I send it, that would be a preprocessor. And if I want to parse the response, that would probably be a post-processor. We have logic controllers. This is to add logic to your script, such as loops or if questions, and also what we call the workbench, which is the temporary working space. So let's go ahead and bring up JMeter itself. So this is what JMeter looks like. Again, it's a Java-based tool. I'm running on a Mac right now. And the first thing we really want to do here is create a really simple static script within JMeter. So within JMeter, you'll notice at the top, you have a lot of icons. I'm not going to go over all of them. Uh, you have kind of your normal menu stuff. On the left-hand side, this is where you actually create the logic of your script with all the steps. And here on the right-hand side is where you see the details of all the different steps. So this is a test plan, as we said. This is basically your entire script. I'm going to click on Add threads, thread group. So this is what we said beforehand. This is basically a group of users. This is the first thing you're going to probably do in any script. And you're going to have quite a few parameters here. Instead of going into every single detail of what JMeter can or can't do, I'm really going to teach you the basics of what you need to actually create effective and useful scripts. And you can always go back in and look at all the fine details if you want to. So I will sometimes cut some corners and not explain every small detail. Kind of like on a cooking show where something's already pre-made. So this is the number of users. So let's say I want to create a script which is going to have 10 users. And ramp up period, this simply means how long it takes in seconds to go from 1 to 10 users. So again, think of simultaneous users who are accessing a website. So let's say also let's be 60 seconds, 1 minute. And how many times do I want to run this script? So let's say I want to run this script three times. Here is in the thread group, and I'm going to right-click and do Add. I'm going to do something called a sampler. Again, this is what we called as to make a request. And I'm going to do HTTP request. And here I'm going to fill out basically the elements that I want for the HTTP request. So before I go so, for today's examples, we're going to actually show how we're creating a script for a specific user scenario. So there is a blogging platform called Ghost. And I installed Ghost on a simple server in order to actually run the tests today. So what we're going to do is see how you can view pages on the Ghost platform. It's a simple uh, blogging platform. How we're going to log into Ghost. We'll see how we do handle user authentication by logging into Ghost. And we'll also see how we can post lots of uh, articles on the Ghost platform with a CSV file. So again, this will cover probably 90% of the user scenarios of people either viewing static pages or doing a login and uploading files, uh, or actually I should say logging in and then you have a list of some data in a CSV file. That could be username, passwords. That could be somebody submitting a lot of posts and you want to use that data as part of your script. So let's go ahead and take this URL right here and let's go back to JMeter. And under the server name here, I'm going to simply put, here's the IP of the server. And the path, this is just slash. And I'm going to add one more thing here. This is called a listener. And I'm going to pick view results tree. This will show me basically for every request what's happening. Without it, I'll just going to be making the request and I won't know what's happening. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play. And I'm not going to save it right now. 
and within the view results tree, you're going to see that all these HTTP requests are being made. They're green. I can look at the response data. Everything looks good. So this is literally in 30 seconds, we just created a very simple script, which just has a single request to this server for this page. And in terms of the amount of users, I'm ramping up from zero to 10 users over a period of 60 seconds. I'm going to loop that three times. So let's actually stop this and create a slightly simpler example. Just so you can see, I'm going to say one user, and I'm going to loop it three times. I'm going to go back to the user results tree, and I'm going to hit in play. And what you're going to see is three requests. Now, if I were to pick, let's say, two users and three times to loop, then I'd obviously get six results. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So this obviously isn't that helpful unless you just want to hammer your home page. So let's look at a slightly more uh, a more realistic example of hitting some static pages on this website. So I'm going to go ahead and open a file which I created beforehand. Here we go. And you can see I've also added some additional elements. We'll go over those in a moment. So obviously, just hitting three pages. Here's the first page, the home page, uh, a post for the endive plant and a post for the turnip plant. By the way, here, if you look at the actual articles that I have on the blog, a lot of them talk about uh, different vegetables. I simply used a, a random text generator, which talks a lot about vegetables. So going back to JMeter, you can see I have three requests, a home page, a post about endives, a post about turnips, and some other elements. So this first element that I added is a cache manager. And since we're trying to uh, cover, or basically we're trying to simulate an actual browser, then I'm going to want to also have the browser cache. We have a cookie manager, which I've added. This will simulate uh, user cookies. This is actually critical for if you're doing a website because obviously without cookies, you can't do much. This totally takes care of cookies for you. You don't need to think about it. And then last but not least, request defaults. Request defaults means that if I don't fill out any form in my HTTP request, it'll use the data from the request defaults. In this case, the actual server IP. So you'll notice when I have all these three requests, I just put in the path. I didn't put in the rest of the information. You'll notice another element called a constant timer. The timers, as we said beforehand, will add delays. So if I don't add a timer to my test plan, then BlazeMeter will just run through all the requests as quickly as possible. But obviously, I want to add some delay between them to be a little more realistic. So this is going to be a third of a second. And if I view the results tree really quick, I can see this is one user three times. I can go ahead and play. And again, I can see all the requests. Everything looks good so far. Uh, some of them I can actually see I'm getting response code three or four. This is actually because in my cache manager, I didn't do clear cache each generation. So as you would expect, as an actual browser, if the same user views the same page, it will uh, you'll get a three or four. It's been cached. If I click here, clear cache each generation, and now I do the same thing, I'll actually see that each request was a full request with a 200 code. So this, in a nutshell, is how I would create a realistic test with as many static pages as I want. And by the way, adding these elements are always done through a right click. So I do a right click, add. And these are config elements, the ones at the top. So I have the HTTP cache manager, the HTTP cookie manager, and the HTTP request defaults. And the same thing for when I added the constant timer. I'm going to do add. This time it's under timers, and it's the constant timer, as well as the listener at the bottom, the view results, add, listener, and then view results tree. So continuing on, this is a, a very, very simple example, but ultimately it doesn't really help me that much because in the real world, I probably want to log into the website in order to do something. So let's look really quick 
at, let me log out first to see what's actually happening, sign out. Let's look at an actual user case scenario of we want to simulate a user logging into a website and then taking some action. So the first thing, let's see what it looks like in the browser. I'm going to go to the sign in page. I put in my username and password. I hit login. And voila, here I am logged in. It notify, it recognizes me by Ophir Prusak. And at this point, I'm already logged in. Now, if I wanted to simulate that, you might have noticed that it's not so obvious what the actual URLs that I need to enter here. It didn't change this much. And there's a lot of Ajax requests happening behind the scene, which I don't even see. So this brings us to the next point, which is recording a user script with an actual browser. The easiest and most straightforward way to actually create your user script isn't just by adding it manually. It's by using your browser to record the activity using JMeter's HTTP recording function. So let's see how that works. I'm going to go back to JMeter. I'm going to close this file. I don't need it right now. And I'm going to go File, Templates. And JMeter now has something called Templates, which will help you set up very standard types of tests. The first thing is you'll notice is recording. So this is a template for recording activity. I'm going to go ahead and hit recreate. You'll notice it already added some things like request defaults, a cookie manager, a thread group, view results tree. But there's two other things here which you didn't have beforehand. One is a recording controller, and more importantly, the HTTP test script recorder. The test script recorder is actually just a HTTP proxy, which will take all of the requests that go through that proxy and add them as requests in your JMeter script. So right here, what we have is the definition of the proxy. You'll notice it's port 8888. And I'm going to bring up a Firefox session that I have. And within that Firefox session under network settings, I'm going to tell it to use localhost port 8888. Hit OK. And I can close this. And now taking a look at my actual Firefox browser, if I go to the page, uh, okay, it's actually refusing connections because I haven't started it. So I'll go back to JMeter. I'm going to hit the start at the bottom. And you can, by the way, you can tell it to exclude automatically by default uh, images, CSS, BMPs, et cetera, which you probably don't want to record anyways. I'll hit start. And again, I'm going to actually show you in two different windows if this works correctly. Now in one window, I do the activity, and in the other window, you can see the actual request being recorded. Let's do try again. There you go. And you can see this is the home page. So you can already see for every request, you can see the activity is being recorded. If I click on a specific request here, again, you can see that request is being recorded. I can go back to the home page. I can click here. So again, every request is being recorded automatically for me with all the information you would expect, such as the uh, IP, the path. Uh, it'll automatically recognize if it's a get or a post request, etc. It'll also have the HTTP header information from the actual request. So it'll be playing back exactly as if you were the same browser. Now, in our case, what we want to do is record the activity of when we logged in. So let's go back to here and let's go to ghost sign in. And you'll see that it's actually asking me to sign in. So let's put in my username and password. And I'm going to hit login. I don't need to remember. Voila, and you'll notice that it actually made some requests. Here's the sign-in page. It actually, it's just two sign-in pages. And I can actually see, by the way, for each of these pages, what JMeter will automatically will do, it will try to group multiple requests under the same page. Because again, for that sign-in step, there were actually a few requests being made. Some of them were Ajax, and JMeter will automatically try to group them. So you can see, 
there's actually a total of six different requests which were made when we did the sign-in uh, process. Now, some of them, for instance, like this one for the CSS file, uh, it, it's just a Google font API. I don't really need this. I can already hit and remove that. But the interesting stuff really happens here under this second sign-in. And you'll notice that the request, uh, or first of all, the request to the page itself, you can see this was a get request. I can minimize this for now. Go back to the actual recording. And again, this will show you the recording of every single HTTP request. So here is the sign in. It was method get. Uh, here is some JS. I don't really need the JS, to be honest, since I'm not going to be executing it anyway. So we can remove that. Here again is the next page of the sign in. Here you can see that it recorded an HTTP post with my email and my password. Here, my email is ophir.prusik at blazemeter.com. And my password is 12345678. Don't tell anyone. And then afterwards, there's some additional things. More importantly, there's something which is asking for some post information. I'm not quite sure where that is, but let's go ahead and leave that in. So I have my recording. And now let's see what I play it back. So when I go and play it back, I can also remove the first three ones because I don't really need these first three ones. These were just browsing. Let's go ahead and remove those. So going back now, when I play it back, let's see what happens. Let's go ahead and do now. You'll notice that the first two requests were successful because those were just the requests to actually get the form itself. But this third request, I actually got an internal server error. Well, that's definitely not good. Uh, and then the second time I made the request, actually, I'm also seeing a 401 unauthorized. And when I try to actually go to the sign-in page again, if I look at the response data, it's empty. If I go here, I get error, please sign in. So something definitely kind of tricky happened there, which is usually the case when you're dealing with any type of site which has authentication. So what's happening here that we might not realize is even though I am submitting my username and password, and even though I am supporting cookies, this site, this ghost blog, uses something called dynamic authentication security or dynamic authentication token security, which means that I can't just pass in the same data every single time, but the server itself is going to actually pass at the beginning of the session something like a session ID or some dynamic string which I need to then go and use for every additional request. So somebody couldn't just, let's say, record the session and then play it back exactly as is and be able to log in. This is basically against people trying to hack the website or basically being able to hack my account. What they do is they add some type of what's called dynamic authentication token. So let's first of all see if we can identify where that's actually happening. And I'm going through again the recording of the requests. And just looking at the requests themselves, I'm not seeing anything which really looks like it would be a dynamic authentication token. They usually look like a very, very long random string. Oh, wait a second, what's this here? XCSRF token. Well, the fact that it's a token and CSRF actually means cross-site request forgery, this is exactly what we want. This token here is what the server needs to know that my requests are indeed requests coming from me and not some hacker. But having said that, I recorded these headers when I went and did my original recording. And so when I'm trying to play them back, that's why I'm getting these errors because the server says, you can't use the same tokens you used last time. That's a different session. You have to use a new one. So how do I get those tokens in the first place? Well, good question. If I look at the view results tree and I look at my very, very, very first request, You'll notice that my first request right here to the sign in page, here we go. The result, which I can see in the view results tree, had within the HTML something called CSRF param content and then some really, really long string. Now, this happens to be the same cross site request forgery token as I had beforehand. So, what we need to do is we need to take the response from the initial request we made, look for this string called 
x uh, crf dash param. Look for this string here, and then pass it in to the request afterwards. So here I can see this is hcn blah blah blah. When I go and I actually do my request here, I need to pass it into this value here and not just have a static uh, static value. So what I can do here is I need to actually get the request. So that brings us to the second part of today's session, which is pulling information from a request and then passing it into a following request. So let's go ahead. And again, I, I re have this uh, from beforehand. I'm not going to do this on the fly. Let's open this file and we'll call this. OK, so here I have the same request from beforehand. I have the sign in stuff. These are the same requests. I have my view results tree. But here you'll notice that after the initial sign in, there's one additional element called the regular extraction, the regular expression extractor. So with the regular expression extractor, this is by the way what's called a post processor. Post processors, if I go to a specific request, what they do is they allow me to take the response and then do some action on the response. So I do add post processors, and then I would do regular expression extractor. And here's this regular expression extractor that I just added. I'll, I'll remove this one for the one that I really need from beforehand. And I won't go over all the details of the regular expression extractor, but I will say this. The first thing is, where is it that you want to get your data from? Do you want to get it from the body of the response? Do you want to get it from the headers of the response? Maybe the response code, et cetera. The next thing is, what's the name of the variable that you want to store this in? So the reference name, this is the name of the variable. Then what's the regular expression that you're going to use to cache that information? So here I actually took this meta name CSR param from the actual HTML code from beforehand. And then this simply means this is the first match you have. So what this is telling JMeter is to take whatever is between these two double quotes and put it in a variable called CSR for token. And then what I did is in my header manager for the requests afterwards, here we go. You'll see that instead of having a hard coded value for X serif of token, I'm actually passing in the variable dollar serif of token. So now what's going to happen is that when I go through and make the requests, it's going to pull in the value from the first time for the first request and then pass it into all the times that I need it afterwards. So if I remember correctly, it's also here. So it's actually in a few of my requests. What, what you can do is if you do a search and replace or do a search, I should say, you can search for the actual token within your recording and then go and replace in lots of places. So I, in this case, if I wanted to see everywhere I have it, I could do for search and look search for a CSRF token. Here's the oh, dialog box actually. Dialog box is down here, just one second. Let me get to the dialog box. Here we go. Sorry about that. Two windows. So I'm going to look for a CSRF token. And if I do search and expand, here I can see within the hierarchy of my test plan uh, where it is. So again, this will show me if there's also a child element in it. But I can see basically I have it once in this request itself within this regular expression extractor and then in the header here and here. So now if I go to the view results tree and I hit play, what you'll see is it'll go to the sign in and this time it's all green. This time if I look at the response, I'm getting 200 and the response data actually doesn't say I need to log in. It actually gives me some JSON data in this case. And there's probably some JavaScript which is taking that JSON data and parsing it. So here we were able to successfully log in. But now that we've logged in, what do we actually want to do? So it's not enough just to log in. We actually wanted to go and do something. So going back, let's actually see what we can do something. Let's say I wanted to add some posts. So let's say I wanted to create a script which will simulate a user adding posts to the blog. So I've already logged in and we're able to successfully do that. 
And if I click here on the plus, I can see it looks for your post title. So let's just do webinar test two. And I'll put in here some text. Here is some text and blaze meter is awesome. Go ahead and at the bottom right, there is, I click on this button here and I do publish now and then publish now. Now, by the way, I clicked on some buttons which are executing some client side JavaScript, but ultimately it doesn't matter what's happening in the browser. As long as I'm capturing all the requests from the browser to the server, I can then go and play them back. So going back to the ghost itself, if I refresh this, I can see just one second. Was that the right one? Oh, this is page two. Sorry. Let me just go back to the not page two. There we go. Webinar test two. Here is some text. Blaze mirror is awesome. So I want to now simulate a user doing this a hundred times to see how much load the server is under when he starts putting in some stuff. So the first thing I actually did was I went back and I recorded a session of somebody going and posting some data. Again, I used the same Firefox. I went in, added some stuff, used the JMeter proxy in order to record all these steps. And this is what it looked like. We'll save some time here. I can do open. And here is add post raw. Here is the actual request. Uh, you can see, by the way, there's a lot of things which you don't need, some images, etc. But ultimately, around the end, this is where the magic happens. You can see that this very latch request, it does a uh, request to this URL with a method post. And here is the post, the actual data itself. Now, this is cool because, again, this was recorded from the JMeter uh, HTTP uh, script recording proxy. You don't need to worry about the format, et cetera. It automatically will identify if it's a get or a post and with the post bodies, et cetera. So here I have, and I noticed when I did a post earlier, the post title goes here and the post content goes there. So again, if I were to go and play this back as is, it wouldn't work because I don't actually have the login stuff. So let's do file, open, and let's actually do add post and see what it looks like. So again, I added the cache manager, the cookie manager, and here under the posts, you can see what I did was instead of uh, just having a random post, here I'm adding uh, a JMeter function. So it'll be interesting. This is a function called random string. I wanted to insert some random data. Uh, you can learn more about all the different JMeter functions on the JMeter website. Or alternatively, if you go to help, uh, Sorry, if you go to options and no, it is under help. If you go to help, uh, there is the ability to get uh, help for all the different functions. It's pretty cool. Uh, but you also have the website, which you can always go and look at all the functions. So this is a random string function. And what should happen here, again, I, I have everything in place. I have the regular expression extractor. I added the ability to have the posts. Here's new post with some random string. Let's go ahead. Look at the blog a second. Here's just webinar test two. And going to the JMeter script, I have one thread, one uh, ramp up, and three loops. Let's actually make this to five loops, let's say. Look at the view results tree. Hit play. You can see the actual login happened. And then I did a post. And you can see this is going to happen five times. Everything is green, so that looks good. By the way, what sometimes you'll see is that one request will automatically make additional requests. What's happening here is under the get here, there's a checkbox which says follow redirects. Very often when you make a request to a page, the server will say there's a redirect. It could be for various reasons. Whatever that reason is, you're telling JMeter to automatically redirect to the page it needs to redirect, which is why we're seeing here uh, what's called a child request. These are totally automatic. So everything looks good. Uh, these are happen to be three or three or three or fours. But ultimately, the most important one is when I actually do the post at the end, response code OK. Here's a response data. This looks like everything was great. 
And most importantly, if I go to the actual blog itself and hit refresh, you're going to see five new posts where the post title is a random string. So that's really cool. But that brings us to the part of, OK, well, what if I want to use CSV data? So instead of just having to either use a random string or some static content, I want to have a list of data from a file and actually use that for my script. Now, that could also be usernames and passwords. In this case, I wanted to actually have the post title and the post content be what I'm going to be using a CSV file. So here's my simple CSV file. Again, I used a text generator, which talks a lot about vegetables. But you can see I have the title, comma, and then the content. So let me actually delete this. OK, title, comma, content, save it. And I have three different articles which I want to add. So going back this time to the JMeter script, this time I'm going to add something called a CSV dataset config. So as always, I simply go to the thread group, add config element CSV dataset config. And this will basically allow me to define what the name of the CSV file is and also what the fields are. So let's go ahead and open one which I created beforehand. And here under the CSV dataset config, the first thing is simply the file name, ghost title content.csv. File encoding is optional. Here you enter the names of the variables that you want to push the data in in the same order as they are in the CSV file. In this case, title, comma, content. The delimiter. And then there's some additional stuff which should be self-explanatory, such as do you want to have coded data? When you get to the end of the file, do you want to uh, recycle it? In other words, if, again, if you can imagine your file is only three line items in it, but you actually are looping through it 100 times, should I recycle? And then should I stop the thread or stop the user when I reach the end of file? Sharing mode. I'm not going to go into all the details, but that should be pretty self-explanatory. So I've now put the data into two variables, one called title and one called content. And when I look at the request or this last request, which actually did the HTTP post, you'll notice now that under title, I've added dollar curly brackets title because that's where the data in the title uh, column is and dollar content for the content. So again, the format for variables in JMeter, if it hasn't been obvious by now, it's dollar curly brackets, the name of the variable and then close curly brackets. So now let's go back here and I have 10 loops. I can go to view results tree. Let's hit play. Again, I'm logging in, going through the whole process, doing the post. Technically, I probably don't need all of these steps. In, in other words, there's probably some requests which I recorded, which technically the script would work without. But just for the sake of keeping things simple, I just left them in. And that looped over 10 times. And I'm almost done. I can do, by the way, scroll automatically here, which will automatically scroll when I get new requests in. I can click on any one of them. As always, look at the response data. Here, do request, see what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. But most importantly, here I can see the post data. So here I can see the actual what the request was, what the response was, everything looks good. And then going back to here, if I go back to Ghost, refresh. I can see that I now have a lot of new posts, which are the actual posts from the CSV file. So going back to what we wanted to learn today, so we talked about authentication example, how I can do dynamic requests by pulling it or extracting value. There was a regular expression, putting them into a user variable and then using them for the next request. I do admit sometimes finding that dynamic authentication token is a bit tricky. My personal trick in terms of doing that, what I like to do is if you go and record the exact same user activity twice, once after the other with the exact same steps, then hypothetically they should be identical except for the dynamic authentication token because that's what's going to change from uh, one session to the other. 
And then you can use your favorite tool, like online diff tool, to compare the two recordings. By the way, when you save your actual script, that JMX file, when you hit save, is a simple XML file that, while it's not super user-friendly, it's still user-friendly enough to look through and see what's happening. I simply use an online diff tool to compare the two, and then immediately I can see the differences. And that's, oh, that's the dynamic authentication token. We talked about CSV files. Now, what we didn't cover today, and I want to make sure we have enough time. Actually, I will go over recording in a second. Uh, what we will have in a follow-up webinar is having more advanced script, functional testing and checking for errors, as I talked about assertions, something called bean shell scripting, which allows you to create in your own scripting language, such as JavaScript, or such as uh, Java, if you have very complex needs, third-party plugins, load and throughput shaping, and advanced reporting. But what I do want to show you is very, very basic reporting. Just to going back to here. So we said listeners allow you to uh, take a look at the uh, data and do something with it like login reporting. So the view results tree, this is great for debugging. But as we talked about in the beginning of today's session, uh, what you really want is to understand the, the response time. In other words, OK, if I now, instead of change this from one user to, let's say, 500 users, am I going to cause the machine to die? Yeah, that's a good question. Let's find out. So what I'm going to add here is some listeners. And again, add listeners. And I'm going to do something called view results in table. And I'm going to add another listener called summary report. And I'm going to add one more listener. called the graph results. Now, a word of warning for those of you who do have a lot of JMeter experience, adding listeners to your JMeter test uh, require a lot of machine resources. So if you're just doing a really simple test with let's say 20 or 30 or maybe even 100 users, yeah, adding these listeners isn't gonna have too much impact on the results. But if you're doing a test where you really wanna push your machine to its limits, because at the end of the day, you're probably going to want to test with maybe 500, 1,000, 10,000, or 100,000 users. Now, you're not going to be able to accomplish that with a single PC, but even when you run in a distributed fashion, you want to make sure that you're doing this uh, with as little impact as possible on the JMeter engine, which means this is great for debugging, but when you're running the actual test in production, you shouldn't use any listeners. You should do what's called post, either one of two options. Either do post test processing, where you download the file and actually import it into some system and, and do it that way. Or if you use BlazeMeter service, BlazeMeter is JMeter in the cloud on steroids. We add a lot of cool stuff. One of the things you also get is real-time reporting without adding any impact to the actual test required resources. But just to show you something really quick for debugging purposes, let's go ahead and maybe not 500 threads. Let's add this, let's say, just to 50 threads and do the ramp up period here of, let's say, 30 seconds. So if I go ahead and I'm going to run it again, you'll notice very quickly how many samples are happening. Uh, personally, I am not crazy about this view. I think it's kind of hard to understand what's going on. But you will see in milliseconds uh, how much on average the requests are taking. You can see in summary report, you can see each one of the individual requests, how long they're taking in terms of milliseconds on average, the min, the max. There's a lot of interesting information here, how many errors you're getting. Ooh, I'm getting a lot of errors here in the post. It could be I forgot to add something here. I'm not quite sure why I'm getting so many errors in the post. Uh, but basically, here you have the high-level data in tabular format. Here you have the data in, in graph format, which personally I don't think is that user-friendly. And you also still have the tree. OK, I'm getting a lot of, of errors here. I'm just going to stop it because obviously there's something which went wrong here. Uh, you can see in a table, this will be every single request. We'll tell you what the status in the sample time. Personally, I don't think this is very user-friendly. Uh, just to show you an example really quick, of what this would look like, for instance, if you were using BlazeMeter. If you go to blazemeter.com and you click on tour, 
here you'll see a sample of what the graphs look like uh, if you're using BlazeMeter. Personally, I think this is a lot easier to understand where you can slice and dice the data. Uh, if you want, you can join our weekly webinar about BlazeMeter where I'll go a lot more into detail about BlazeMeter. But today's session really is about JMeter. Uh, so we'll just leave it that. JMeter's built-in ability to do reporting really is pretty limited. So at this point, there's just a few more things and then we'll go into the Q&A. So this is what we did. And also we will send an email to everybody who registered or is viewing today's webinar with the second we have the follow-up webinar for advanced JMeter stuff. So there's no need to send us an email saying, when is it gonna be, please let me know. You, we will let you know as soon as we have that up. Uh, it'll probably be in around two to three weeks. And for the surprise from beforehand, so if you do want to try out BlazeMeter, we do have a coupon code. It's 60 min JM, so 60 minute JMeter, today's date, 270314, which will give you a 15% discount on any of the annual plans if you do so in the next 30 days. Uh, we will also send out this coupon code in an email right after the webinar, so don't worry about writing it down. It's 60 min JM270314. Since we have about 10 minutes left, uh, let's go ahead and go into some Q&A. So what I'm going to do is go through all over the questions that people had. Go ahead and submit additional questions if you have. Again, I didn't have a chance to go over everything. Uh, there's lots of great information both on the uh, official Apache JMeter website, though sometimes it can feel like an encyclopedia, to be honest. There is also Stack Overflow if you have specific questions. BlazeMeter, uh, we ourselves very often answer questions there. And there's also, and this is my favorite, the official BlazeMeter blog. We will very often, if you go to our blog, we will very often uh, blog about lots of cool stuff in JMeter itself. So things like uh, Windows authentication, how to run test of 50K users, WebSocket testing, uh, templates, memory usage. There's a lot of really good stuff here on our blog. As well as if you go to resources, we have a knowledge base, which also has a lot of great things about JMeter. So now let's go ahead and go through the Q&A session. Uh, as I said beforehand, a lot of people talk about uh, the specifics of features which we're not going to cover. So like I said, we're not going to cover bean shell that will be recorded in advanced stuff. In terms of Ajax calls, so like I said, if you're capturing with the recorder, it will also record all the Ajax calls. Uh, just going through the Q&A. Uh, not, so somebody asks about filters. I'm not quite sure to do that. Uh, I think ultimately just you should be very aware that all of the things you're doing here in terms of your recording, whatever, uh, JMeter, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that JMeter can do it. And again, we're not gonna be able to go over everything. But just for instance, when you're actually doing a recording, if I go here, file, I get templates and pick recording templates. For instance, you can filter out uh, what URLs to include or exclude. So for instance, you would exclude any request which is to a third party analytics or something like that. Uh, Alain is asking about playback using IIS logs. That's an excellent question. Uh, there is a Apache log playback ability. Uh, from my experience, uh, it, you know, it, it works fine. One thing you should really be aware of, and this is something which is very fundamental in terms of JMeter. Everything we've talked about so far talks about adding users and also adding a delay between users. But one of the things we're going to be talking about in the advanced uh, is what if I don't want to test based on users? What if I want to test based on 10 requests per second or 50 requests per second, and I need to know how many requests per second my app can handle. That's something which is gonna be covered in the advanced. Uh, specifically re regarding playback of IS logs, I would highly suggest you do a search uh, for JMeter playback IS logs, and you'll probably get a not bad answer. Uh, I myself answered some similar questions on Stack Overflow a few weeks ago. Uh, Again, some more questions. 
So somebody asks an excellent question about what's the difference between blaze meter and J meter. That's an excellent question. I'm going to go ahead and just take two minutes to tell you a little more about blaze meter. So blaze meter basically allows you to take your J meter tests and then a run them in the cloud. So one of the things which we didn't really talk about is, well, what if I need to simulate 5,000 users? you're not going to be able to simulate 5,000 users from one machine. Uh, in reality, depending on the actual machine you have, you might be able to simulate between, let's say, up to 1,000, maybe slightly over 1,000 users. So the question is, what happens when I need to simulate five or 10,000 users? You do need to then execute your JMeter script in a distributed fashion. Now, you can try to do this yourself. It's a lot of headache, and it doesn't scale. Or you can use a service such as BlazeMeter, which allows you to do something as simple as when I click to add test, I can now take my JMeter script, which I wrote beforehand. I simply upload it and under JMX files. And let's say this one, for instance. And here I can define how many users I want to run this test. So what BlazeMeter does is it automatically will take your script and distribute it among multiple physical servers in the cloud for you. And then you get this cloud-based server farm, which can run your test for you. Uh, this specific account actually supports that I'm playing around with 60 engines in parallel. So you can test up to 60,000 concurrent users. BlazeMeter does have the ability to run up to 500,000 concurrent users, which believe me is a lot of machines. Uh, and then there's some other cool stuff. Like I said, the reporting, we have integration with uh, tools like Jenkins and tools like New Relic. I'm not gonna go over that right now. That will be in the advanced session. Uh, but the main difference is that Git is to GitHub as JMeter is to BlazeMeter. We run JMeter in the cloud on steroids, a lot of cool features. Uh, regarding API, somebody asked, again, it's exactly the same. When you make a request to an API or a request to a, a web page, it doesn't matter. You're still going and doing an HTTP request. You do have within the uh, request though, something called uh, a sampler. There is something called, I think it's a uh, SOAP XML or depending on what you need, it might not be a simple HTTP request. You might actually have a SOAP request. Uh, there's also some third party plugins. One thing which I forgot to mention or we mentioned in the more advanced stuff is there are third party plugins which will also add to the ability of JMeter. Uh, excellent question by Vidali about mobile testing. Excellent question. So uh, you, in the same way that we use the recorder today to record the uh, user traffic from a browser, we can do the same thing with a mobile device. And I actually had a webinar uh, about a month ago specifically about how to test with mobile. In the follow-up email, I'll send the link to that webinar. Uh, Again, some people ask about new versus old stuff. There will be a follow-up, which is more advanced. I will send a link about the mobile webinars. Uh, ah, so somebody asks about, what about tracking failures? That's an excellent question. So one of the things which we didn't cover today, which we will cover in the advanced scenario, is something called assertions. And I'll just say in, in 15 seconds, Assertions allow you to add logic to what you expect would happen. And if it didn't happen, raise an error. An assertion can be based on the response time. So let's say if a response took more than three seconds, then I want to raise an error. Or it could be based on the content of the response, such as response assertion. So I'm not going to go into this, but basically it allows you to say, if something didn't happen, that I want to be considered an error. Uh, somebody asks about the cache manager. Does it use the e-tag header? Uh, yes, again, you, you have all that stuff. You have all those things. Again, you can look at these specifics. To be honest, if you go to apache.org uh, and look at the jmeter.apache.org uh, and they have a very detailed, let me just do it here real quick. Let me go back to jmeter and get rid of this one. Simply do a search for jmeter. Uh, here we go, JMeter, 
And if you go into the component reference, this is kind of like an encyclopedia, but it'll explain every single element. For instance, when we talked about the uh, cache manager, it'll also talk about e tags, etc. Everything you should want to know, it's all here. Uh, it's a bit like an encyclopedia, but all the information is there. So again, somebody asked, what about cloud-based applications? Yes, it doesn't matter where your application is. You can test it with JMeter. Uh, as long as you have connectivity from the machine you're testing it with to uh, your application, uh, you can test it with JMeter. Uh, okay, somebody asked a little more about static files again. In terms of static files, and this is something which you know I should actually show here in terms of the report. So if I go really quick back to blaze meter uh, and, and what admittingly I would, we didn't cover uh, fully today is that other half of that first slide where performance testing is about creating the load and it's about measuring the response. Now, admittingly, I have to say JMeter doesn't do the best job of measuring the response. It does give you some high level data based on what we showed you uh, with the listeners, but Again, you know, my, my personal preference is to really uh, understand the responses here based on a graph like this, which will show you based on how many users you had, what the response time was. Now, should you or shouldn't you include static files? It really depends on what it is you want to test. If you just want to test the back end, let's say database, then don't include static files. If you want to test the overall user experience in terms of, well, how long did it take to load all the JPEGs, images, etc then include it. It's, it's two different things. Uh, again, we will be uh, sending you a link to this webinar on YouTube, recorded version, yes. Uh, the location of the CSV file, to go back here of the CSV file, and I'll do file, uh, it's basically within the CSV dataset config. You'll notice here that in the CSV dataset config, there is an element called file name. So if I leave the path empty, it will look in the same path as the CSV file, or as the JMeter is. Uh, I could also do uh, slash users slash Ophir, et cetera. You know, if I'm on a Mac or a Linux box, if it's on a PC, it would probably be C uh, colon, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how JMeter knows the path of the file. Uh, Darren is asking about uh, what is the value of following redirects? Uh, you know, it's, there, there's pros and cons. It really is up to what you want to test. I will say that in a lot of times when you are trying to simulate a login, if your request doesn't have the correct authentication token, instead of an error, it'll just do a redirect to the same page with the new authentication token. Sometimes it's important, sometimes it's not important. Uh, excellent question by Roger about rule of thumb of how many users you can actually load on a JMeter application based on the RAM CPU of your machine. What we found and what we use, like to use as a best practice is up to a thousand, I mean, it depends on obviously a lot of things, up to a thousand users uh, is ballpark what you're going to probably get with a quote unquote standard machine. Now, unfortunately, you, you can't just give a machine with twice the RAM and CPU and get twice the amount of results. Since this does run, run on Java and Java has its own scalability issues, uh, you do have to at some point start using distributed machines, which is what BlazeMeter is for. So I would say up to a thousand users for a straightforward script, you're gonna run you know, no problem locally uh, as long as you have a modern machine. Keep in mind, you also might have issues regarding the network connectivity if you're doing this locally. So your actual PC might not be able to make enough outgoing requests per second to not be a bottleneck itself. When running on the cloud, you don't have that issue. And last but not least, the whole network connectivity side of, if you're running this from your own PC, you're simulating the you know, thousand users from where you're physically sitting. When you do it in the cloud, you can have this distributed and you're gonna get much more accurate results. Uh, there's some more questions about how do I get uh, data from uh, the results on the page? Again, the same way I showed you the regular expression extractor, uh, you can go through the different post processors and pull in whatever data you want from the page. 
Again, the presentation will be available afterwards. How many threads? Like I said, up to a thousand, I think is ballpark what you should shoot for on a modern day machine. Uh, yes, it can be used for mobile. Uh, somebody, oh, somebody's asking about, uh, excellent question by Shitu about, well, what if I wanna have my script run on a regular basis? Excellent question. So JMeter itself is just a tool. It, it doesn't, you know, work in a, uh, in a vacuum. Now, what I've been showing you so far is what's called the GUI-based version of JMeter, which means it has a nice GUI. But JMeter also has a command line version, which, uh, which is actually what BlazeMeter uses when you run it in the cloud, since we don't use, need to use all the resources of the uh, GUI-based version. So if you wanna have JMeter run automatically, you can run it from the command line. And if you do a search online for automating JMeter with the command line, you can do so by having your own script run it every 10 minutes. So you definitely can by the command line. Uh, one of the cool things about running it in the cloud, by the way, is you don't have to have a machine which is gonna run it. Uh, BlazeMeter also has an API which would allow you to either run it automatically or we also have a scheduler. So that's one of the benefits of, of having it in the cloud. Uh, Somebody asked about the cache manager and the cookie manager. So just to show you how easy that is, you simply do a right click on your thread group or your controller if you're using a recording, add config element, and here you'd pick either your cookie manager and your cache manager. It's literally just, you, you add it and it works. Uh, how many threads? So there's a lot of questions again. Um, about how many threads it can support. We will send out a link. Uh, somebody's asking about excluding images in CSS. So this again goes back to when you're doing performance test, there's, I would say, two types of performance testing you wanna be doing. You either wanna test your, truly test your backend. In other words, if imagine a user makes a request to a page which has a database call, do you wanna know how many requests your backend can handle or how many users it can handle? Or do you wanna know if you're using, let's say a, a content delivery network, do you wanna be applying stress to your content delivery network? It's really up to you. Some, you, know, you could usually be probably be doing both, starting with just your backend. And this, when that's optimized saying, well, now I want the overall user experience and make sure that the images in the CSS load, load uh, as well. Uh, again, multiple users, uh, that's simply creating multiple threads. If it wasn't obvious beforehand, uh, the number of threads here, this is how many concurrent users you're actually going to be running. Uh, there's an excellent question about running a Selenium WebDriver with JMeter. So what we didn't cover at all, there is a way to run a real browser within JMeter. It doesn't scale, unfortunately. So you're talking about uh, basically one browser per thread in terms of ballpark. So with JMeter, I can run a test of 100,000 users using what's called the Selenium Web Driver with JMeter. I can probably do a couple of hundred at best, and it's going to be a lot more expensive. That's something which we can cover in the advanced stuff. Uh, somebody's asking again about reporting. That's that's a bit more advanced. Uh, we will cover reporting in the advanced stuff. Uh, Ah, there's an excellent question about, well, what if your site only allows users to be logged in one machine at a time? Uh, that actually is something which would require you to probably have a CSV file, which is split across users. And that's one of the really cool features here. If I go back here and do add test, uh, BlazeMeter actually has a feature which will automatically split your CSV files across the different load servers. So again, imagine you're running a test in the cloud on BlazeMeter with 20 servers, but you wanna make sure which have username and password. You wanna make sure you're not logging in as the same user on different machines at the same time. This feature takes care of it. Uh, excellent question by Quincy about what about to have everything be automated on CI? So if you're using a tool like Jenkins or TeamCity or Bamboo, BlazeMeter does have a plugin which will allow you to do that. If you do a search on Google, you'll also find some articles about how to integrate JMeter on your own servers uh, with Jenkins. It's a lot more complicated, but it is doable. 
Uh, so it definitely is doable. Uh, ha, this is okay. This is the type of question which I'm always like, this is interesting. So what if the authentication tokens are actually created by JavaScript and there's no way that it's going to be, come back from the server? Uh, if that's the case, you actually need to recreate another. If there is some logic that is only happening in JavaScript uh, and that's where that information is originating from and it's not coming as part of the request and you need to recreate that, you will probably need to recreate that logic within JMeter itself uh, using either JavaScript in JMeter, uh, but you need to obviously recreate it or some, some other mechanism. Uh, there's some more stuff. Uh, ah, so somebody's asking, wait, is Blazemeter free? Is Blazemeter paid? Excellent question. So JMeter itself is a free tool, which you can download and use from anywhere you want. Uh, which which is great. And Blazemeter, it is a commercial tool, but we do have what's called a free tier. So if I go to the pricing a second, you'll see we have our free tier, which allows you to run as many tests as you want in the cloud for up to 50 users. If you want more than 50 users, we do have different levels of, uh, of accounts. But what we found is that if you're just doing, I mean, if, if 50 users is enough for you for the cloud, Go for it. If you need 100 users, you can probably do it from your own machine. If you need 5,000 users, that's really when we actually want to talk, and that's where we think it makes sense to start thinking about uh, BlazeMeter as an option. Uh, ah, so there's another excellent question about, well, what if I need to get back-end information from the actual servers themselves? Excellent question. So when I click here on Tour, what I can see is these are the response times that I'm getting from basically what's called the client. In other words, in this test, let's say I have a, a website with users that I'm quizzing over time, and I can see that the response time is going up and then it peaks up. So this tells me what's happening for the client. Okay, it took 20.5 seconds to respond to this page, but what's happening on my back end? What's actually happening on my server? Is it the database which is slow? Is it the CPU or memory which is slow? Excellent question. So uh, in that case, you do need to use a client-side application performance monitoring tool. Personally, we recommend New Relic, which is a great tool. Uh, that's something which we will cover in the advanced topics, how to use New Relic with Blazemeter. Uh, there also is for Blazemeter users a, uh, a special partner only tier, which they don't talk about publicly, which gives you much better than their normal free tier for free if you are a BlazeMeter user. We'll be more about that in the advanced. Uh, so somebody asks also, what about uh, bandwidth issues? Excellent question. Or what about if he needs to limit bandwidth issues based on mobile? So BlazeMeter does have a feature which will allow you to limit the bandwidth and increased latency to simulate mobile traffic. Uh, that's something which is really specifically about Blazemeter. It's not something that JMeter has built in. Uh -huh. How accurate are the measures that are made with JMeter? Excellent question. So I can guarantee you that the measures themselves are extremely accurate as long as A, you're not overburdening the server itself. And by not overburdening the server, we've done internal tests where let's say you run a test and uh, you're actually, so let's say you're hitting a very strong backend with, uh, you're attempting to hit it with 2,000 threads or 2,000 users on a single JMeter machine. And you saw that the response time is 30 seconds. But what was actually happening is that the JMeter server itself, which is creating the load, was at 100% CPU and it was slow. And when we ran the same test, but now across that 2000 users, we actually had it four machines, each with 500 users and the load generators themselves were not burdened, then the response time we were seeing was only 20 seconds or two thirds of that. So basically as long as you're not overburdening the load servers themselves, it's gonna be accurate. 
ultimately, JMeter is by far the most widely used, it's the 800 pound gorilla of load testing. And if the measures weren't accurate, you would hear about it. And one last thing you should be aware about, are the measures accurate? Just always remember what it is that you're measuring. Very often people will think that what they're measuring is the uh, time, let's say it take for the, for the user, what's called time to render on the screen. But what could be the case is that you're loading some images, which there's some fancy JavaScript, which only shows them when you scroll down to the bottom of the page. So just make sure that in terms of the requests you're making, you, those are factored in in terms of the response times. Uh, there is some more stuff about what types of timers. Again, that will be in the advanced stuff. Uh, a question about uploading scripts in BlazeMeter about the CSV files. So one of the reasons, you might have noticed this, one of the reasons in my CSV data set config that I didn't put a path name is that this way I can use the exact same script both locally and when I upload it to BlazeMeter. BlazeMeter, when you go to add a test, you can also upload your own CSV files. You can also upload uh, any JMeter jar plugins that you're using. And if you upload a CSV file, you do have to keep in mind that you need to remove any path data from your JMeter script because it's going to be uploaded to the same directory as your JMX file. So as long as within your JMeter script, you don't have any path information, then it'll work fine when you upload it to BlazeMeter. Uh, the cost of BlazeMeter, again, if you go to blazemeter.com slash pricing, uh, recover the cost. I will say that very often people come to us and say, well, you know, I understand the ballpark of your pricing, but I'm really looking for a plan, let's say, which is slightly different. We do also provide customized plans depending on your needs. Again, for the mobile stuff, I will send a link with the webinar about that. Uh, yes, you can do multi-part form data requests in JMeter. That's advanced. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, so in terms of, okay, so going back, I guess, to one of the basic questions, and I know we didn't answer it too much, so I'm just going to spend literally 30 seconds here, is when you go to understanding how to improve, because this is all about improving performance. So the first thing you need to understand when improving performance is really, well, what, what is it that I need to improve? And the way I figure out what is it that I need to improve is finding where the bottlenecks are. And in order to find where the bottlenecks are, I need to create load, which is going to generate the bottlenecks. So in this case, actually, I'm going to go to a slightly different report really quick. Uh, in this case, I'm going to show you a report, which will show you the process of from start to finish. So let's say for a second, I actually went and recorded a script through JMeter, which is able to simulate users going through my website and slowly increasing the load. What you're gonna see is that the number of users increased in this specific graph. The response times are initially gonna be flat. And then at some point, the response times are gonna go up. They might spike up in this case, if it's not a highly optimized site, or they might go up very slowly if it is a highly optimized site. What you need to do now is you understand, first of all, your site in this case can handle around 650, 700 users. That's the first question. But B, how do you get it to handle more users? That's where you have to have a tool such as New Relic, which will tell you, okay, when you're hitting 650 users and your site gets slow, what is the bottleneck? And New Relic will tell you, is it your database? Is it your memory? It'll actually show you the innards of your application and where the time is going to. Through part of that process, it'll, you'll notice that, okay, there's a SQL query, which initially was taking, you know, very quick, let's say 50 milliseconds, but at this point in time, it jumped up to 5,000 milliseconds, which is huge. So I then go look at my database, figure it out, make some changes, and then I run the same test again. And the second time that I run it, I'm going to basically see if I indeed improved or didn't improve the performance and repeat. So it's run the test, make a change in your back end, look at the results and repeat. Uh, so there's actually a question, and yes, you know, we will also have a detailed session about report analysis. How do you actually find where the bottleneck is? Excellent question. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into Selenium. That is covered, will be covered in the advanced stuff. 
Uh, also talking about the bandwidth of the internet also increases. So I guess what I was saying beforehand, make sure that the bandwidth of your connection is not limiting your test. If you're doing it from your PC, uh, I know at home I have cable modem, which has great download speed, but not great upload speed. And when I do some testing from home, uh, I know I'm actually limited by my own cable modem. Uh, cookie managers that required for login authentication, I would say 99% of the time you should always be using cookie manager. Uh, regarding listeners, that'll be an advanced .NET applications. Uh, JMeter can test any application. It doesn't matter what the backend is. Uh, I think that's a big misconception since JMeter itself is written in Java. Uh, it's just the tool itself. It's like saying it doesn't matter what technology Chrome is written in you can access any website. So you can test anything which ultimately can talk HTTP, you can test with JMeter. Uh, regarding Linux, that's beyond the scope of this uh, question. Can you test video sites with JMeter? Excellent question. The answer is JMeter really isn't the best solution for testing video streaming. And, and I'll, I'll be a bit more specific. If you need to test RTMP uh, or MTMP streaming, or I forget if it's RTMP or RTMP streaming, uh, JMeter isn't the best solution. Uh, since JMeter really is built about HTTP protocol, there are plugins for third parties such as video streaming. But from my personal experience, uh, if it's HTTP based, JMeter is for the win. If it's not, you can usually get it to work, but it's not usually the ideal solution. Uh, some more stuff. Ah, there's another question about what about all the content that's referred in the source code of the HTML? That is something I'm going to show you really quick since it is kind of basic and I forgot to mention it. In these HTTP requests, which I have here, at the very bottom you'll notice there's a little checkbox that says retrieve all embedded resources. So while JMeter won't parse the HTML in the same way that a browser would, and it definitely won't run the execute any JavaScript, it does have uh, a pretty good parsing engine which will look for links to resources within your HTML files. So if you have a straightforward website, which includes some images, some CSS files, maybe even some includes just some JavaScript, you can still tell JMeter to retrieve those resources to get a more realistic load and more realistic response times from, uh, from your requests. So that's what this does here. Uh, minimum RAM for load generation machine, uh, I would say, you know what, at least realistically depends on what you want to do. I mean, if it's a modern day machine with let's say two gigabyte, rem two gigabyte memory, you can do some testing. From our experience, I would say eight gigabyte RAM is usually the sweet spot if you want to do testing. That's what we found is, is the best kind of trade-off of memory versus how much you can do. Uh, does JMeter handle NTML authentication? Again, you know, for all these, what it does or doesn't handle, uh, I, I don't have time to go into everything. I will say that there are plugins for uh, for almost everything out there, for OAuth, for uh, Windows authentication. there's I, I remember we actually have in our blog even recently talking about Windows authentication. Uh, there probably is a plugin for whatever authentication you want. There is a Selenium integration with JMeter, which I'll talk about in advance. Uh, what if the CSV has more than two columns? If that wasn't clear, you can add as many columns as you want. You can even have 50 columns. You can basically put whatever you want there. If it's 50 columns, just put in 50 variables. Uh, so somebody's asking about what if it's not web-based, like a Windows application uh, or iOS-based application. So JMeter is about testing a backend. So I don't care if it's an iOS application or if it's a uh, you know Windows native application. If that system makes an HTTP call to any backend, you can test the backend. You're not going to be you know if you have a bug in your iOS application, which is just a front-end bug, you're not gonna see it, but that's what not JMeter is for. JMeter is really about creating load on your backend. Uh, somebody asked about Wireshark and JMeter. Actually, if you send an email to support at placemeter.com, uh, it is possible, but talk to us about that. Uh, 
Again, a question about is the bandwidth of the internet also depends for increasing threads. Uh, the ability to increase threads does is limited also by your connection. Does Jmeter have support for Python? You know what? That's an excellent question. I'm not quite sure. I, I do know in terms of scripting, Jmeter does have Bean Shell, which is JavaScript. Does have JavaScript, JavaScript scripting as well? I'm not quite sure. Uh, Eclipse, uh, not sure about that. Uh, some other questions. Running the script remotely. So this goes back to, yes, you can run Jmeter in command line. Uh, which does allow you to run it on any machine you want remotely. Uh, you know, you'd have to look more information about that online. Uh, excellent question, uh, Vidali, about what's the differences between BlazeMeter, LoadRunner, and HP Performance Center? Uh, in a nutshell, I will say BlazeMeter is a lot cheaper, first of all. Uh, JMeter is based on open source technology. And uh, beyond that, you know, so if, if you want to spend a lot of money, by all means, go ahead and spend a lot of money. Uh, we do have a lot of clients. I, I, I didn't go over our client list, but, you know, Disney, Gap, to name a few. We have lots of enterprise 100 clients, Adobe, uh, which have switched from HP's products to BlazeMeter because... They want an open source based solution, which everybody can run within the enterprise. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of open source solutions out of the box, such as JMeter, doesn't give you the feature scalability as well as support you need. And ultimately, they're very happy BlazeMeter clients. Uh, so we can go over the specifics more if you want one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, again, we will cover Selenium integration uh, and other stuff. Advantages of JMeter or their other performance tools, that's a bit beyond the scope of this conversation. Uh, but I will say in terms of high level pros and cons, if you're looking for a tool which is extremely flexible in its ability to simulate any type of user scenario, such as logging into a website with OAuth and dynamic key authentication uh, using WebSockets or what have you, uh, there really aren't any other open source tools which are as flexible and accurate in terms of what they can support as JMeter. Having said that, JMeter does have a bit of a higher learning curve of if you just need to hit a static URL of a homepage over and over a thousand times, then you can use the HTTP Bench or AB or some other open source tools, which will just give you the ability, or curl even, which will give you the ability to hit those URLs. Uh, the fact that it's open source, I personally think speaks for itself in terms of pricing. Uh, and then you always have BlazeMeter if you need either commercial support or commercial features. Uh, so that's it for today. That's a lot of questions we definitely did go over. Again, we will be sending out the recording. Thanks everyone so much for joining. And we'll also be sending out uh, the coupon code. If you do have questions, you can always send an email to support at blazemeter.com. Uh, actually, let me go back to the slides here, Q&A. Uh, to support at blazemeter.com, uh, if you have sales questions, you can also answer. I can also answer here if you have sales questions. Uh, again, thanks everyone so much. We will be sending out an email for a follow-up. Uh,